I think we need to give them a warm welcome. Hey, do we have some numbers? Do we have a way that we're going to decide who gets to go first? Yeah, we do. Um, which one of your birthdays is the closest? Give me your birthday. June 14th. January 7th. February 20th. Yeah, January 11th. February 1st. July 1st? July 5th. July 5th, okay. If it was the first, you would have won because we would have shared a birthday. July 8th. What is it? July 8th. July 8th. Ooh. January 15th. You're going first for the first one because your birthday is the closest. Okay. All right, Hank, you want to tell him what he's going to be doing? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. That was a magnificent introduction. We know why we're here, right? I get I get one off the cuff comment. We are here because one politician won an election and decided he saw something that was much prettier somewhere else and ran for another office. So, 10 people have stood up to say, I think that's the job that I, can, I should handle and I should have. Am I right, ladies and gentlemen? Nod your heads, yes. Anyone that isn't nodding their head, yes. It all comes into play. Um, you're all going to be getting a ballot. We're taking a straw poll today. And just like two years before a presidential election in Iowa, it means absolutely nothing. But we are going to post results on our Facebook page. If you haven't been on our Facebook page yet, <coughs> you can tell now would be really, and all of the candidates now would be a really good time to like that Encino Chamber Facebook page. <laughs> okay, we just picked up 10 more likes. Yes. You're each going to get a minute <coughs> for your opening statement. And if you see that really wonderful woman in the back, Carrie, Carrie is going to be keeping your time. At the yellow, you've got 50, uh, 30 seconds. And at the red, you've got 15. And when you hear this, it means you're done. Um, I will try and very nicely tell you that you are fantastic, that you had a fantastic response, but it is time to move to the next person. Uh, since. Let's see, we're going to go to the left for the first time, and then, yeah, we'll just go to the left. You're probably wondering where the questions came from. They came from my pocket. The questions have come from my brain, with the approval of our president and our CEO, and Atusa, you got them as well, correct? Just nod your head yes, because you got the email. So, no one on this panel has seen the questions either. Everybody, did that? Applause is what I was asking for. Thank you. All right, let's get warmed up by having your opening statement. Remember, Carrie is going to be keeping time. Are we introducing first, or are we... Uh... I'm pretty much going to say, be able to figure that they're going to be saying, Hi, my name, now. At this chamber, we are being taught that to start with, hi, my name is, allows the human brain to just say, oh, I've heard that before, and turn that to now. So you may, candidates, want to start with an attention-getting phrase, something that will make our electorate remember you. So, with that, Chris, Chris Kalski, it is your turn, please begin. I'm, I would like to go to Sacramento to change what's happening in California. My name is Chris Kolsky, and I'm running for the 45th Assembly District in this uh, special election. I ran uh, against Blumenfield uh, last year. So basically, it's a continuation of my race. Uh, with the demographics the way it is, I think I've got very good results, and, and I hope to build on that and I hope to uh, go to Sacramento to change things. I lived in the Valley since 1985. 
uh, with my wife and my, I raised my kids here. And I would like to leave a California for them that offered what it offered to me. Uh, basically, I think uh, they're through, in the last 10 years, we've seen a great decline in California. Remembering back when I got moved to California in 1962, this was the greatest state. We had the number one educational system. We, uh, the economy. Let us move to the next speaker. Uh, uh, candidates, if you wish, you can stand up. You don't have to be seated at your at your table. Thank you for that. We're going to go to the left. That isn't a political statement. It was just the way I chose. Actually, random. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dan McCrory. I'm under all these clothes. I'm naked. Um, I've been involved uh, with the, uh, the corporate world for many years. I worked for uh, at and for over 35 years. And uh, when I was with at and I wanted to have a hand in my own destiny. So I became involved in the labor movement and worked on advocating for uh, my fellow workers and also having a hand in my own destiny. I also got involved as an entrepreneur and as a freelance writer. I, uh, I actually was the National Writers Union now, which represents uh, book authors, uh, freelance journalists, and bloggers. And I uh, want to make sure that you realize that just because I'm labor doesn't mean that I'm not pro-business. We worked for many years with AT&T and its predecessors and making sure that uh, the business was successful. Uh, I've also been involved with the uh, our leader chamber of commerce. Thank you. Not to be confused with the Encino chamber. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Susan Shelley. I am a Republican candidate in this race. And let me tell you what is at stake in this election. Currently, the Democrats have just lost, with the resignation of Mr. Bloomfield, they have lost their two-thirds majority in the Assembly. What they were doing with their two-thirds majority in the Assembly is trying to raise your taxes. Right now, there are seven separate proposals in the State Senate waiting for the coast to be cleared to make it easier to raise property taxes. If I am in the Assembly, I will vote no on all of them. I will not permit the, the apparatus to be put in place for the voters to raise property taxes for the 55% instead of the 67% vote. They want to make it easier to raise your property taxes. If those things get on the ballot, they will pass and taxes will go up. I'm endorsed by the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, and I am here to protect Prop 13. Thank you. Well done. The only person that finished under time. Remember that. We go to the far right. So far. So far. We go to the right. Good afternoon. My name is Glenn Bailey. I'm a lifelong Valley resident and have owned my home in Encino for over 30 years. I'm a product of public schools, uh, Cleveland High School in Reseda, uh, Pierce College, where I was student body president at California State University, Northridge. I was elected twice to local office, the Resource Conservation District of uh, the Santa Monica Mountains, most recently, and served from 1991 to 2005. It was a volunteer non-paid position, but it is a subdivision of state government. I've been an active leader for many years, including the fight against moving the Hollywood Park racetrack from Inglewood to into the Sepulveda Basin back in the late 70s. And more recently, the Valley Cityhood effort, pushing to get that on the ballot, participating in, in uh, trying to get that passed. More recently, during the past decade, I've been on the Encino Neighborhood Council. Where I Thank you. Thank you very much. We move to the left. Thank you. First, I want to thank you guys for inviting us to this to uh, come and speak with you. I want to let you know that this is more than a quest or a job for me. This is a passion. I thought about this a very long time. When I did the research on what it took to run, I have to be honest, we stepped back. But something stronger and greater kept pulling me back in, so we knew we had been in a lot of purpose. I decided to run, quite frankly, because I know I can do a good work and make a difference in this community. My background as a community organizer, a community advocate. My husband and I own a small business for the last 30 plus years in San Fernando Valley. I founded my own nonprofit organization, which has, because of our great work, has been endorsed by presidents 
Bill Clinton, and President Barack Obama. I'm embedded in this community. I love my community. Everything I am and everything I will be has, has been founded in this community. So I thank you and I'm humbled to be here. Thank you, ma'am. And we're Good morning, Encino. My name is Damian Carroll, and uh, I'm pleased to be here today. Uh, we have a great field of candidates in front of us, but I want to tell you what sets me apart from the field. Number one is experience. I've worked for the last 10 years in local and state government, uh, and, and in terms of people who can go up to Sacramento on day one, fight for the valley, fight to get funding for our schools, for our transportation corridors, uh, for our infrastructure, for our, our water use. I'm the person who knows how to navigate up in Sacramento and get these things done for you. I worked very closely with Valley businesses, both when I first came to town working in the film and television industry, an industry that we all need to protect and make sure that those jobs are staying here, it benefits everybody here in this room. And also as a deputy and as a district director, uh, working with chambers of commerce like the Encino Chamber, where I came to speak just a few months ago about issues of importance to us all here. I'm a parent. I have two daughters. The oldest one is in public school. She was in Encino Elementary. And Kester, and I want to fight for you. Thank you. Thank you. That was really well done. Let's move <laughs> to the next one. Um, they, it, the longer you speak, the stronger that will get. Next. Hi, my name is Matthew Bobney. I'm born in San Fernando Valley. And for the last nine years, I've served as Congressman Brad Sherman's Chief of Staff and District Director. And many of you have seen me in Encino Chamber of Commerce events over the years, and I really, really want to thank you guys for hosting us today. I want to start by saying I knew I was going to be close with most of my opponents. They're good friends. I didn't want to be this close today, but it really is a pleasure to be with all of them. Uh, the Valley is very special to me. Uh, for many years, I've had the great opportunity to work day in, day out to solve problems for Valley businesses, individuals, and organizations. When they come to our office, our servants, office with their problems, we work very hard to solve those issues. I want to take that level of service to Sacramento where we have some big challenges facing the state in education, in transportation, in deciding how we're going to set up our health care exchange system, and making sure that we're fighting for resources here in the Valley. I want to take the level of service I've learned from Congressman Sherman to Sacramento. My campaign has also been endorsed by Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom, State Controller John Chung, City Council Member Dennis Sign, and you. a number of local Thank you and very much. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Dennis DeYoung. I'm a resident of Northridge. My campaign slogan is elect representative, not a politician. Born and raised here in the Valley. My mom Beck, was born here in Casino, and I'm a lifelong uh, Valley resident and a, a big passion for community members. I'm currently uh, president of the uh, Love Association of Cal State Northridge, um, and I, I'm really concerned about uh, the financial uh, direction that the state of California is going into. I believe that uh, you know we have two state cities right now that are bankruptcy stock in San Bernardino, and I, I don't see that happening here. So there's some major issues with pension reform, with unfunded liabilities, pension liabilities, health care liabilities, Medicaid. These things take leadership. I, my vote is not bought or sold or rented to any labor union, uh, special interest. Uh, I'm certainly an independent uh, type of person when it comes to, to, to uh, representing the Valley. I love Valley. I think we have a lot of potential here, and uh, I really can't wait to, to represent you in Sacramento. Thank you. That's two. Gonna finish the Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Edenstein. I'm in the center. That describes me politically uh, as well. So, just when you thought all the elections were over, here's another one. But I'm actually excited about the opportunity to be here. I'm the only candidate who has deep roots in this district, born in Tarzana grew up in Woodland Hills, so I know this valley so well and had an intimate track record of problem solving and delivery for you. You know, my dad died when I was a kid, and it teaches you a lot. It makes you mature early, grow up early. But one thing I know for sure is we have a lot of problems we face, but together we can fix those man-made problems and accomplish things and get California back to be the great state that it was. And I look forward to working with each and every one of you to do that. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm a California government teacher. I believe in government, which is why I chose to teach government. My name is Amber Hoffman, and I'm a Democrat for Assembly. And I believe that one person can make a difference, just like each and every one of you do every day with the good work. 
I'm also very proud to uh, say that I've been endorsed and supported by Bob in the field. And I plan on continuing the good work that he's done with all of you while he was representing the 46th district in the assembly. I work at Glendale Community College. I have 16 years of experience as an educator. I am a single mother. I understand the issues that face us regarding education, pre-K through higher ed. I also understand the fight for health care, and I want to be part of implementing the Affordable Health Care Act. And I plan on bringing jobs back to the West Hampton as well. So I might be last to speak today, but I sure hope I'm first when you do uh, your polling today. And May I have that microphone? Okay, I need help from two people. Uh, Melody, give me a number between um, one and ten, please. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You will be going first. Uh, another pass. President Mark Levinson, I need a number between one and six, please. Number three, we're starting with the third questions. Oh, cool. <laughs> Okay, the question, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> with few exceptions, I believe that the proposition system in the state was, have, has heard and will continue to hobble the state. Tell me why I'm wrong, or tell me what you would do to change the system and make it better. We start with Elizabeth Badger. One minute. The proposition, uh uh, situation in this state is, is important. It's important that we get things done, and that is the only way that we can get to the people by implementing propositions. Some propositions I am for, and some propositions I am against. For example, Proposition 13, I understand that there's a peck in the way of Proposition 13. Proposition 13 uh, was designed to uh, help us in our property taxes, and not right now I understand that uh, the last uh, assembly person have, have implemented uh, a way of packing away about Proposition 13. Our seniors, they live in their homes because of Proposition 13. And I, for one, uh, even though uh, we pay probably two or three thousand dollars a month for, for our property taxes, I don't want it to go up. And I certainly want to preserve our seniors and our, their homes and uh, we need to work to make sure that we can find revenues in other ways regarding the size packing away a proposition. Thanks. Thanks. We'll go to the left. So uh, I agree there's a lot of problems with the state proposition system. Uh, one of those main problems comes down to ballot box budgeting. Uh, this is when uh, we vote for things on the ballot, and they always sound really good, but there isn't money attached to how they're going to be implemented by the state. And this means that in many cases, the state is required then to spend money on items that don't go through the regular budget process and it makes it difficult for the legislature. So one thing that I would like to do is to institute a rule that says if a, if a, if a project is going to be voted on on the ballot, that project should identify where the money is going to come from, either through some new revenue that it identifies or by shutting down another program in the state, one that isn't working, maybe one that isn't working as efficiently. This is a great way for people to still be able as voters to weigh in on the uh, items that matter to them in the budget, but also to do it in a fiscally responsible way that will allow us to keep our balance the budget going forward. Thanks. That was good? Very good. You're voting. You're, you're just giving credit when they're on your time, aren't you? Yes. That's, that totally depends on what, how you think of their answer. I, I'm following your pattern. Sorry, you're okay. You know, we're holding this election to make sure that we have representation at the state level to pass laws and bills that reflect our values and reflect the needs of our state and the valley. And too often I feel like the legislature has passed on important issues and put it to a proposition to avoid tough votes. There are times where I feel like voters should vote correctly on issues, but as we've seen too often, over 521 times in the last 100 years, our Constitution has been amended. And now with the influx of special interest money and shadowy groups that are paying for huge windfalls for their own personal interests and corporate interests, I feel like we need to get back to the basics and make sure that legislation is happening out of the legislature. And in rare occasions when we need to take a vote at a state level, we have a proposition system that makes sense. 
Uh, but I look forward to going up to Sacramento to work on legislation and not passing the buck forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry Singer. Uh, there's a, certainly a role, and I would agree, in terms of propositions. Uh, some are good, some are bad. Uh, unfortunately, what uh, has happened in recent years is that there's been special interest and, and uh, have sort of hijacked the system. Uh, we've seen like situations like prostitution and hate the same sex marriage where, where uh, basically the courts threw out whatever the voters voted for, the courts were able to supersede. So I think there's a lot of frustration among voters and apathy because no matter what they vote for, the courts are going to overrule that. And I, and I understand that frustration. Uh, but there is a place. I, I would honestly don't believe that we would have a balanced budget for the last three years if it hadn't been for the proposition that, that threatened to withhold pay to the legislatures for not passing the budget on time. So there certainly is a, is a case for it when the legislature is unable and are unwilling and doesn't have the backbone to act. There are good parts and there are bad parts to the proposition system. It's the most pure form of direct democracy to make sure our voices are heard. That's great. Where we come into a problem is when we deal with propositions in the budget. When it earmarks certain funding and locks up certain kinds of funding. That's when we get into the problems that need reform. Um, and as, as it relates to the budget in whole, we need to look at uh, performance-based budgeting. Um, there's over 500 specialty accounts with all kinds of fraud, waste, and abuse. So I think that's where the reform needs to happen. Um, but certainly there are many good parts to it as well. As a California government teacher, um, I believe in direct democracy. That's one of the great, great things about California. And without the initiative, the recall, and the referendum, California wouldn't be what it is today. And when we talk about the state budget, we just passed Proposition 25 not too long ago, which allows us to have a balanced budget with a simple majority in the legislature, rather than this crazy idea of a supermajority. So I support the initiative process. I support direct democracy. Uh, the proposition system in California is what makes California a truly democratic uh, uh, type of a uh, state. Uh, it is important that the people have a voice when the legislation does, does, not, does not want to take action or when the people disagree with the legislation. This is a way for the people to speak out and say, we don't want this or we want this. Uh, Prop 13 is one example. Uh, actually, I was involved uh, with Howard Jarvis and Paul Genn working on Proposition 13 in 1978. And, uh, and, and this process really worked. It said to the government, there's got to be a limit. If you're going to tax uh, properties at a high value and put people out of their homes, uh, we have to put a stop to them. And it worked. Not all propositions. Uh, uh, are good, depending on where you stand on the issue, obviously, but uh, it gives a chance for people to speak. Thank you. I think the idea behind the proposition, uh, the whole talent initiative thing, I had really good intentions that have now been thwarted by a special interest that I uh, think they can uh, govern better than the people up in Sacramento. And in some cases they're right. Um, but. Um, I agree with Damien here who says that if we're going to submit something first, we need to have uh, lawyers look at it and make sure of uh, the legal implications because sometimes the devil's in the details and sometimes um, uh, there's a, a good intention behind the, the ballot initiative, initiative that ends up causing problems somewhere else down the line. We need to make sure that uh, the money is there to pay for them because again, uh, ballot initiatives have locked up so much of, of the budget up in the Sacramento these days that there's hardly any wiggle room at all. So we really need to make sure that uh, the initiative has funding uh, to pay for itself and also to... Oh, finish the sentence, wait, please. To... Replace programs that aren't working. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll leave you I, I, it would bother me all day. Okay, here we go. Go ahead, Susan. The proposition system is an expression of distrust of the legislature. That's why we have it, because we don't trust them, because they are not trustworthy, because they do not do a good job, they are not responsible to our problems. The balanced budget that they say they have is not balanced if you look at the teacher's pension, if you look at 
the uh, state employees pension, CalSTRS and CalPERS, they're not looking at what we owe on that. They've taken that out. They're balanced only in what they're looking at. They're not looking at the amount of money we're borrowing from the federal government to pay our unemployment claims. Those three things, hundreds of billions of dollars, completely off the books as far as this so-called balanced budget. They are not trustworthy. That's why we have this proposition reform. That's why we have this direct vision. If we have quality, trustworthy, legitimate, honest people in government, we can talk about reforming direct democracy. But we can't talk about it because we don't have ethical people in Sacramento. They have lied to us about how much they're spending on education. Under Darn. Oh. You had finished early. I was going to have a follow-up question. You're up, Glenn. Glenn Bailey, I support the initiative process, and I support the ability of the people to vote on propositions that are put on the ballot by the legislature. We wouldn't have had Proposition 13, even though many people were losing their homes because of the increased value of properties and the unlimited ability of local government to write a check for whatever they wanted to until the people rose up and put it on the ballot and passed it. I would suggest the consideration of a couple of reforms. Number one, no paid circulators. If it's a good idea, let the people do it as volunteers and get it on the ballot. Number two, there should be an opportunity for the legislature, although they aren't doing a good job at that, to review measures first and possibly put something on the ballot. They do that anyway, but um, I think that should be similar to what the city does under the, under the new charter. You know, recently we had a proposition, Measure A, on the ballot from the city, a sales tax increase. I was the only one who, on this panel who signed the rebuttal of argument Thank against you. it. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Pollock, may I have a number between one and six, please? Eight. <laughs> it took me a second. Number one through six? Four. One, two. Awesome. Great question. Okay. Tell you what, we're going to begin, uh, Mr. Evans, here in the middle. The question is, this shouldn't take a minute from every one of you. What past or current legislator would we recognize in your legislative style? You know, there's a, stand by. There's a lot of good uh, legislators, past and present, to, to look for. Thank you. I think you have to learn from the good ones and not so much from the bad ones. Um, my boss, Council Member Koretz, um, used to be in the legislature, and he understood the need to be honest, true, and also take a moderate position. So bring everyone to the table, and so every side has a chance to be heard. Whether it's a labor union, a business interest, I think that's the most important part. Nobody should go in dictating what needs to be said. Everyone should have a chance to make their argument, and then a compromise is reached. That's how you govern. Um, Bob Lumenfield, obviously, who's done a fantastic job, uh, not only in the state legislature and in Sacramento, but right here in this district. And I think um, we've all proven that by electing him to the city council. And I know he's done fantastic work with all of you in this room. And again, I hope to continue on with his legacy and all the good work that he's done in the state legislature. Uh, I would say uh, Assemblyman Tim Downey. And the reason uh, I think he's a, uh, someone I would like to uh, work with is because he's for liberty. I think we have forgotten that what made this country and this state great is liberty. Through freedom, we, we develop economics, uh, economy, good economy here. We had schools, we had everything because we had freedom. Now, the government is supposed to be transparent and people's privacy should be uh, preserved. Now it's the other way around. Uh, the government knows everything about us, yet they operate in secrecy. Uh, I think liberty is what I stand for and for uh, what Tim Dundee stands for, and uh, I would have been like that. Even though I don't have those endorsement, I also have to say Bob Blumenfield. He, uh, I ran against him uh, in 2008, 
and uh, we had many discussions and saw each other on the stump all the time. He and I both agreed that uh, we were very alike in a lot of our points of view, and I uh, was impressed by once he became uh, an assembly member how well he viewed that line and uh, taking care of both the left and the right uh, while traveling down the middle. And uh, he was able to do a lot for a lot of people, and I'm hoping I have big hopes for him as a city council. Hi. Well, I have been endorsed by Assembly Republican Leader Connie Conway and Senate Republican Leader Bob Huff, and I hope that I will be able to influence them to copy my style. <laughs> my style is sensible government. I believe that we can look at all of our old regulations and see what's out of date, and look at it without fear that someone will attack us for talking about it. For example, everything should be cost and benefit. We can change the law on small checks, and I will propose this. They should be every three years instead of every two years. Why? Because they're increasingly expensive for consumers, and they have a diminishing benefit for the state of California. That's something we can look at. That's something we can have fresh, a fresh outlook on. There are many regulations affecting businesses that are just left over from the 70s, and we should look at all of that and be sensible and be up to date in what we're doing to ourselves here in California. Interesting. Go for it. I wish the question had been who don't we emulate because I think that might be easier to answer. You can answer both if you wish. But, um, <laughs> Someone else, yeah. In the state legislature, I think more often than not, it's the special interests that are buying and selling power and influence, and that's what's governing things that happen in, in, up there. So I don't support the current system. And because I am the only independent candidate on this uh, in this race I have, so far, because filing hasn't closed yet, um, hopefully I can play that role. But as far as someone who's dating myself, but Bernardi Bernardi had the courage to vote no in city council. He had the courage to fight against the CRA when it wasn't politically popular to do so. And so he is he is someone who uh, I I respect and admire. I um, I don't put any of them on a pedestal. They're just regular people like, like you and I. However, if I had to choose a, a legislator, I would probably uh, choose my own city council, um, uh, my past, my previous city council uh, member, Dennis Zion. He was a man of, of, of quality, a man of character, a man of inclusion. He worked with the elderly, the, the young folk, the uh, uh, high school people, so children. So he put children first, and he put the community first. So if I were to choose a legislator, it would I would emulate uh, his style. You know, it's, it's very easy to be cynical about politics, but I've been very lucky to work for three outstanding legislators who represented the valley, and I would emulate all three of them. State Senator Jack Scott later became the chancellor of the community colleges. It has a great Texas draw, is able to bring people together, he's a very compassionate man and very smart on policy. He came to politics having already learned a lot about education and higher education issues and really brought that expertise up to Sacramento. Uh, Assemblymember Mike Feuer, who is now our city attorney, is a man of great integrity, of great smarts, and not an ideologue. He works together hand in hand with people to get things done and make progress. My current boss, Councilmember Paul Krikorian, who's the chair of the city's budget committee, who's been doing terrific work without trumpeting his own accomplishments, getting the city's balanced budget in a time of great need. Uh, I'm also endorsed by City Controller Laura Chick, who uh, used to represent a good part of the valley on the city council as well, as well as our current senator, Fran Pafford. Thanks. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, I've been very fortunate to work for Congressman Brad Sherman for the last nine years, and uh, I would want to implement Congressman Sherman in the State Assembly. He's hardworking, he's dedicated, and most importantly, he believes in representative government. As many of you know, he lives in this community. You'll see him at the concerts in the park. You'll see him at the local chamber meetings. You'll see him at the neighborhood councils. He really believes to be a good legislator. You have to be a good listener. He takes Valley Values back to Washington, D.C. every day. And he makes sure that the valley is not only represented and gain its fair share, but that people know that he's accessible.
when you have a problem, whether it's your business, or yourself, or a family member, or a friend, you know where our office is, you know that we're there to help, and that we're going to make a difference. So I've also had the great privilege of being endorsed by a number of other great legislators like Councilmember Dennis Zine and a number of the Congress's colleagues in Congress, Mark Takano, Loretta Sanchez. These are great legislators. I look forward to taking what I've learned from them to Sacramento. Does that mean you'd be passing out the state of California plans? <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting question. I would say uh, one. I, there's two uh, legislators that uh, that I know and respect that represent here in the valley. And one was a guy named Bob Hertzberg. Bob, uh, I think, really represented the valley well. And it was, it would be an excellent layer if the valley was there. It's, it's on the city. Um, also, a guy who passed away recently, uh, who I knew personally, and I'm dating myself, but uh, a fellow by the name of Keith Richmond who was a Republican. Keith was a, a, a served full full six years up in Sacramento. He was very much an advocate of pension reform. If some of the things that he would have advocated then uh, passed, we wouldn't be in the problems that we're in today. So both those gentlemen, one of the Democrat, one of the Republican, both are respect highly. They're ethical, they're honest, they're in, 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 they had a high degree of integrity, and that's the type of people we need in Sacramento. We are done. Uh, let's see, a two senior president elect, right? Question number between one and six, please. <laughs> one. Cool. Good question. Uh, let's see. Who, has, who would like to start this one? Hands? The hand went up. You get to go first. <coughs> we recognize people who put themselves out there. What program or law from an, another state would you like to implement in California? And your time's running. <laughs> well, um, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of terrific legislation that came out of. Um, that's, what, that's what yeah, questions you're not going to hear other places. <laughs> shouldn't, have, shouldn't have volunteered to go first on it. <laughs> well, I'll say right now, Washington State recently passed uh, gay marriage in their state. I'm a big supporter of LGBT equality. I believe that our state should have been the, in the front of that instead of trailing up the year with our recent uh, court hearing. Um, and I believe that we should be making marriage equality the law of the land across the United States. It's great for business. Uh, you can believe that we're going to be having a lot of weddings here in California in the next few years. And it's just great for us as a people. We need to recognize uh, equality in our nation, equality in our state, uh, and it's a terrific way to start. Washington was privileged to be able to have uh, one of the first ballot propositions where people voted affirmatively to support gay marriage. I'd like to see that happen in California. Well done. You had to go first. Matthew, you're up. I would uh, echo my friend Damien's sentiments. I'd also like to say, not so much in another law, but uh, California has a film tax credit. We put $100 million into it, and this year 31 projects got that $100 million. There's another 350 projects that got put on a waiting list. States like Arizona, Texas, Georgia, Utah, Massachusetts, find those waiting lists and call those projects and say, guess what, we have tax credits too. The state of Massachusetts, which is far smarter than California, puts $40 million into it. North Carolina does $25 million. Nevada does $25 million. So what you're seeing is those three states match California basically in amount of money put under a film tax credit. I'd love to double our film tax credit to make sure that those other 350 projects in the film industry that produce tens of thousands of jobs throughout our economy, especially here in the Valley, are being funded and not going to Georgia and not going to New Mexico. The two top primetime shows on television right now are shot in Georgia and New Mexico. Why? Because they each got tax credits there. Two good answers. Keep it coming. Interesting question. Uh, Last uh, last week, I have two daughters, a 19-year-old and a 15-year-old. So last week, I was at the DMV in Winneka. Have anybody been there in that line on the yeah. sidewalk? So my daughter was getting her uh, learner's permit, and uh, and the line was literally, we were there before it opened, it was out to the sidewalk. And I was thinking, you know, this is ridiculous. In Arizona, when you get your license at 16, you know the next time you go to renew it, you're age 65? Okay, 65, right? You don't have to go back and renew and get a line at the DMV. And it's ridiculous that we do that every five years here in California. It should be at least every 10 years. Same thing about auto registration, you know, every year, why won't every other year? I mean, I mean, there's so many things that California needs to think about out of the box and say, we need to be uh, more uh, 
you know, uh, advanced in terms of technology and using what's out there to be able to, to have a better relationship with our people and the taxpayers. And certainly at the DMV, anytime you, you go there, you can just see, you know, evidence of, of a state that's, that's in crisis. So certainly that would be a small thing. I talked about hours about attainable goals, and certainly you know, extending the renewal for DMV would probably be a good idea. Get started. Dennis, before you pass that on, may I, add, may I ask one, one addition to that? Sure. Can you make it 16 and then 18 because the newer drivers are the bigger insurance risk and you want to check on them? Would you be willing to accept that amendment? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Just trying to compromise here. You may have heard or seen the governor of Texas in our parts talking about how business friendly his state is. Um, a non-existent, basically, corporate tax, gross receipts tax. I think we need to compete on that level with our, with our small businesses. Each and every one of you face and deal with this every single day. I'd be a little more rough with the uh, governor. I'd tell him to mosey on out of here if he tried to take some of our business and, and jobs out of here. So I think we need to compete with other states and bring that down to a, a level where we are going to create jobs and have our small businesses prosper. You did mean that governor of another state, you didn't mean that. Yes. Okay, just wanted to confirm. I strongly believe also in bringing film production back to California. And the state of Oregon is actually meeting with several production companies. Um, the whole entire legislature has sat down with several production companies to offer incentives and bring production into Oregon. And not only is it good for the film companies, but it's good for all of the businesses around the film companies. There was an example of a small hardware company, a small family-owned business, struggling in Oregon. They brought in a pilot to film from California, and now that business has grown and has employed 25 employees. And all of the other businesses around the production have grown. I think it's something we need to implement here. Um, they're doing it in Louisiana as well, and the other states that my uh, opponent mentioned. So that was something that I feel strongly about, and I think the state of Oregon is a place where we could look to sort of uh, model what they're doing here. I think uh, what I would emulate is basically uh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, where uh, they looked at the problems that the public sector unions were causing. Basically, public sector unions are extorting money from the tax basis. If we are going to look at fiscal responsibility, we have to deal with the unions. We know that they have a lot of power, that they put legislators in Sacramento and in the Congress because they're collecting uh, dues and they're turning them around and using for political purposes. This is, when you talk about special interest, this is the top special interest. I think we should deal with the unions and I, would, uh, I think Wisconsin would like to judge. Okay, this may be a little controversial, but uh, the drug war has failed. We might as well legalize marijuana. Uh, think of all the taxes that would come into this state if we did that, and also it would cut out the illicit drug trade from Mexico because there would no, be no more reason for them to cross uh, the border into California and, and sell it here. Um, I think we could raise millions and millions of dollars, and I, I think it's an idea worth looking at. Tax it, regulate it. Okay. I would take a policy from Texas that they call lawsuit abuse reform. And what that means is that they have changed the laws so that people have to show actual injury before they can be sued. You don't just have roving bands of attorneys going into your business and saying, this is four inches too low, and this doesn't look like the right kind of sign, and this is last year's warning sign, you need next year's warning sign, and you're two weeks late, and we're suing you, and if you don't settle with us immediately, it's going to be in the courts where there have been all these cutbacks, and civil suits take years, and you're going to be paying your lawyer thousands, tens of thousands, lawsuit abuse reform, you should be able to run your business they should only be able to sue you if there's an actual injury. I believe it's Nebraska that has a unicameral legislature, and so I would propose that. Um, it's kind of ridiculous to have 80 members running every two years. The, in one house, 40, and uh, the other house, 40 members running every four years, and jumping back and forth, term limits. You know, it was one reaction to the dysfunction in Sacramento, and then there was another vote, and honestly, you know, 
are we any better off? I don't think so, because now we're spending a million dollars on this election and millions of other dollars on other elections so far this year, and I'm sure that'll carry on. So um, I would suggest that. Thank you. Yes, I'll finally stand. <laughs> I, our students are under siege. Oregon has just passed a law that allows our students to graduate and not pay. And after 25, and then after they graduate, they commit 25 years to the uplift of their communities. So I think that's a fabulous uh, law that we might want to bring to California. Well done. And I can avoid paying my student, my, my children's college. <laughs> she still finished. It's not your time. Okay. <laughs> Lou, you've been on the board a while. Give me number two. One of three is already been picked. Two it is, and we're going to go to this end. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Very scientific way to do these things. Sorry. I meant ten. Got it. Let's see how you are compromised and paying attention. Name one thing that you like that a member of a different party than you has done in California in the past year. Um, wow, I just saw 10 people go. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Redo. Redo. Give them another number. No, this is no, it's a tough question. Every one of them has said they will they would clean up California in one form or another in their opening in their opening. Tell me something. Let's see how you are in compromise and paying attention. Name one thing, one thing that you like that the opposite party or a member of that party in California has done in the past year. You can pass. Okay, because I can't really think of anything. There we go, we pass. We'll get to you. Well, I can't say that this was done by one person specifically, but I do part company with the Republican Party on a few issues. I do support a woman's right to choose in early pregnancy, and I do support marriage equality, and I think the pursuit of happiness applies to everybody. And in that sense, I do support what some of the other party members have, have done. Cool. Far end, Mr. Bill. One issue that was disappointing yeah, after a number of years of attempts was getting a statewide uh, plastic bag uh, measure, which um, you know I think it's indicative of special interests. And so now we have a hodgepodge of, of different laws in, in local areas. And so um, to the, for those legislators that voted for the ban, I would support them, the party. And um, I think that's something that the legislature could have solved in a California challenge by making it the law, just like on the uh, CRV for the, um, the deposits for uh, recyclable uh, bottles and cans. Senator Steinberg, although not a Republican, he did uh, rally all the Republican legislators to support the special needs program. That is very um, dear to my heart. I have a child with special needs. So we were, the, so with his support, all of the the, the um, Republican senators who were able to pass a reform for special needs children. Great work, Republicans. You know, when independent districting was proposed in this state, the Democratic Party was vociferously opposed to it. And I stood up at the Democratic Party in the San Fernando Valley where I am almost a lifelong member, and they have endorsed my campaign, but I was very strong in saying we should not be opposed to this. Uh, this is a process that gives the districts and drawing the district lines into the hands of the people instead of the legislators, legislators that inhabit those districts. I'm proud that independent redistricting passed on the state level. I think it's led to a terrific district for us here. It's a nice, compact, easily defined district, all entirely in the Northwest Valley, with everything from CSUN to Pierce College to Warner Center and the Santa Monica Mountains. Very easy for a person to, to represent and very easy for voters to understand what it is. So uh, I've been on the opposite side of my party. That's a great example uh, where I stood up and said, we got to do this. This is right. One of the issues I focus on in Congressman Sherman's office is how
housing and making sure that we have a robust housing market and we're increasing the values of everyone's number one investment, especially in this district. Uh, the congressman has been for years working on a bipartisan basis to make sure that we continue to expand and preserve the conforming loan limit. I know Lou, you'll know exactly what that means, but basically for years you couldn't get anything but a jumbo loan for over $450,000. He worked with a Republican colleague, Gary Miller, he's a Republican congressman from the Inland Empire, to make sure that we passed that conforming loan limit and kept it going forward with FHA loans. Any realtor will tell you that helps save the housing market, especially here in the Valley. And for everyone that has their home as their number one investment, I believe that legislation is going to help make sure that we rebound here and is why the economy is going stronger and housing prices are going up. So I appreciate Congressman Gary Miller's work with Congressman Sherman on the conforming loan limit. Well, I would uh, point to uh, just north of here that we have a, a senator, a Republican senator by the name of Jeff Gorell. And Jeff uh, has been working with uh, Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom in terms of a gold team approach in terms of saving jobs in his district. And I think that's really what we need to do here in the San Fernando Valley. I grew up here when it was aerospace and entertainment, and we had a lot of good, well-paying jobs. Uh, with excessive regulation, high taxes, and just a litany of, of errors, we've been driving out our employers. Jobs are the mother's milk of our economy. I've been a real estate broker for 25 years, I've been a stock broker for close to 30. I can see what, what jobs, how important jobs is to real estate, to the values, and to a family. And what we've been doing here is replacing good paying jobs with low paying jobs. And so doing what, what Jeff Burrell is doing in his district to attract employers and give them incentives and bring them here. And uh, that to me is something that, that uh, I, would, I would like to emulate if elected to the state center. I would point to Republican Councilman Mitch Englander. He's been a leader in public safety and calling out the Los Angeles Fire Department on its response times. People's lives are the single most important thing in the core function of our city. And I've been honored to work with the Encino Chamber of Commerce Emergency Prep Committee, Melody and many others. You know, God forbid when the, God forbid when the big earthquake happens, all of our emergency responders are telling us we need to be prepared. Weekend after weekend, this chamber uh, my office and many others work on a drill so we can have a command post to be self-sufficient when that happens. Thank you uh, for all your work on, on that. So my field is higher education. I work for Glendale Community College.